The EcoSport, Ford's most compact SUV, is a revitalised package in this revised form, aimed more precisely at the fashionable needs of city-bound but adventurous buyers. With smarter styling, a completely upgraded cabin, improved infotainment provision and, at the top of the range, a fresh four-wheel drive option paired with an efficient 1.5-litre turbo diesel engine. If you're looking for a small super mini based crossover and haven't considered this car in the past, it's now worth a second look. Thinking of a Ford EcoSport in your search for a small super mini based SUV? You may not be, and with good reason. Original versions of this model did, after all, struggle in comparison with obvious rivals. This much improved version, though, looks far better placed to seriously interest you. On the face of things, Ford has done quite well with this car since its original 2014 launch, with over 150,000 EcoSports sold in Europe since, contributing to a healthy 30% increase in SUV sales across the company's model lineup. The reality, though, is a little different. According to the Blue Oval brand's own figures, SUV sales across the continent for the market as a whole have increased by a whopping 280% since this car's original introduction. As a result, currently one out of every three new cars sold is an SUV of some sort, which means that the way things are at present, almost any volume maker crossover product is going to sell in reasonable numbers. The bottom line, though, is that this one ought to have done much better. There are a number of reasons why it hasn't. For a start, the Echo Sport was launched far too late, Ford having misjudged the growing importance of the segment for small super mini based SUVs, popularized as early as 2010 by the trendy Nissan Duke. Which was ironic, since way back in 2002, the company introduced a Fiesta-based model, the Fusion, which, if it had been packaged and marketed right, could have cleaned up in this class way before rivals had even got their contenders to the drawing board. Instead, the Fusion was sold as a slightly bigger, uh, slightly more versatile kind of Fiesta, uh, sat largely unwanted for most of its life in the corner of Ford showrooms and wasn't replaced. When the more overt and in-your-face Duke arrived and started selling by the truckload, the Blue Oval brand realised its mistake, but didn't have a European-designed small SUV product to sell in this segment. The company's South American division, though, did. Ford, having been selling a jacked-up Fiesta-based SUV called the Echo Sport on that continent since 2004. Quickly, the decision was taken to make the second generation version of that car a model that could be sold in Europe as well, with production sourced from a low cost labour Ford factory in India to allow for attractive showroom pricing. In the rush to get this model to market though, there was little time to tailor it for the needs of European buyers, and the result was a car that fell below customer and media expectations in terms of ride handling and cabin quality. The Echo Sport was quickly updated in 2015 and 2016 with improvements in all these areas, but it was all too little too late. Which is why we've got the car that we're going to look at here, launched in early 2018. It's not a completely new generation Echo Sport, but it's very much the next best thing, with no fewer than 2,360 new parts apparently transforming this product's proposition. As you can see, the styling looks far more sophisticated and mature, plus the cabin's been massively upgraded, not least with the brand's latest SYNC 3 infotainment technology. Under the bonnet, there's a new entry-level 100 PS 1.0-litre EcoBoost petrol unit, while at the top of the range, there's an all-new 1.5-litre EcoBlue diesel variant that brings four-wheel drive to the lineup for the first time. And everything's now screwed together in a state-of-the-art European factory in Romania. It all sounds quite promising, doesn't it? Let's put this car to the test. The news that this car is based on a Ford Fiesta should certainly set you off in a positive frame of mind when it comes to the drive-on offer. 
The issue though is one of exactly what would happen to a Fiesta if you gave it a relatively lofty 190 millimeters of ride height, 136 kilograms of extra weight and a chunky high riding body. After all, even Ford's chassis engineers aren't miracle workers, something which was fairly evident from the driving experience served up by this car in the form delivered to us at its original 2014 launch. In that earlier guise, this crossover gave its customers a brittle ride, plenty of cornering body roll and virtually no enthusiasm for dynamic driving whatsoever. It was all quite disappointing from a brand with such a heritage in handling excellence. Quite a lot of this was down to the fact that the original version of this model was essentially a South American product rushed to the Western market before Ford's Belgium based senior chassis experts had had a proper chance to fine tune it for European roads. As soon as the engineers at the company's Lommel test track just west of Antwerp got hold of the car, things started to change and significant suspension updates were introduced in both 2015 and 2016. Most of the work that the team put in though was saved for the facelifted design that we're testing here. Obviously they couldn't do much about the fundamentals, the basic torsion beam rear suspension setup, or the fact that this car runs on the rather old B car platform of a 2008 generation Fiesta. But just about every dynamic element that could be changed has been. Uh, springs, dampers, steering, even the ESP stability control. It's all been tinkered with and tested not only at Lommel, but more importantly on typically appalling British roads. The result of these efforts is a decent difference in the way this car drives, but perhaps predictably it falls short of transforming the end product. Let's start with the positives. Uh, the fact that the consistent and well-weighted electromechanical steering is way better than before. The brakes are also impressive with a degree of assistance that's just about right for this class of car. And if you opt for a manual model, the gear shift is sweet and precise. Ultimately though, what could be achieved here was rather limited by the high boxy shape, a big contributing factor to the way the car feels uncomfortable with sudden directional changes at speed. True, pacey cornering around tight bends can be undertaken with less body roll than was the case previously, but the stiff springing necessary to make that possible delivers ride quality that continues to fall below class standards, noticeably firm and prone to rather crash through ruts and tarmac tears. As you can perhaps imagine, adding larger 18 inch wheels or the stiffer sports suspension you get on top ST line models doesn't help matters here. As for traction through the turns, well actually that's quite reasonable unless you push the car a lot harder than a typical customer ever would, something that the rather over enthusiastic ESP stability control system prevents you from doing anyway. In short, you won't be finding excuses to throw this car about, so it's just as well that the dynamic standards amongst rivals in this class are so relatively mediocre. That's starting to change though and Ford knows it must do much better with the next generation version of this model. At least highway cruising refinement is perfectly acceptable, marred only by a bit of wind noise around the door mirrors. You'll want to know about engines and the news is good here. There's finally a good reason to buy this car with diesel power thanks to the addition of a new 1.5 litre EcoBlue 125 PS turbo TDCI unit at the top of the range. We'll get to that in a minute. And perhaps more importantly, there's a new entry level petrol power plant, a 100 PS version of Ford's one litre three cylinder turbo EcoBoost unit. This at last replaces the wheezy old 1.5 litre normally aspirated petrol engine that propped up the previous lineup. Most EcoSport customers though will continue to opt for that 1 litre EcoBoost power plant in the 125 PS form that we've chosen for this test, which is the engine you have to have if you want the option of going for the 6 speed automatic gearbox that we're trying here. Unusually, this auto box actually improves performance, taking over a second from a sprint time that with a stick shift would see you to 62 miles an hour from rest in 12.7 seconds on the way to a 111 mile an hour maximum. 
As before, this little three-pot EcoBoost engine can also be had in perkier 140 PS form, though paying more for the extra power translates into disappointingly little in terms of extra performance. The figures here see 62 mile an hour reached in 11.8 seconds en route to 116 miles an hour, which probably says quite a lot about the fact that the older tech underpinnings of this car make it significantly heavier than most of its rivals. That tells, of course, when it comes to performance. Uh, a rival Citroen C3 Aircross with just 110 PS gets to 62 miles an hour nearly half a second quicker thanks to its 120 kilogram curb weight advantage. Earlier I mentioned diesel power and the fact that there's at last a properly modern turbo diesel TDCI engine available for those wanting it. Unfortunately, this doesn't replace the previous normally aspirated Oldtech 1.5 TDCI 100 PS unit that the EcoSport has campaigned with since its original launch, an engine that even Ford would rather we didn't promote too heavily. So we'll do no more than mention that this feeble, noisy power plant remains in the model lineup and move swiftly on to a TDCI engine that is worth talking about, the willing, talky EcoBlue turbo unit I mentioned previously. Now this develops 125 PS, making possible a 10.9 second 0 to 62 mile an hour time that's over 3 seconds quicker than the normally aspirated diesel variant. More importantly, the TDCI EcoBlue version has 300 newton meters of torque. That's nearly double what you get with the EcoBoost petrol engine, making possible an 1,100 kilogram brake towing capacity, which means that for the first time, Echo Sport ownership will be a possibility for those wanting to tow small caravans and trailers. Something that would also be of great help in this regard is the four-wheel drive system that you have to have with the EcoBlue engine. It's not available elsewhere in the range and works with a more sophisticated rear suspension setup. We've previously always been told by Ford that 4x4 traction was irrelevant in the SUV B segment. Well, apparently not. This uh, intelligent all-wheel drive setup is particularly sophisticated, continually measuring how the wheels are gripping the road surface and, in line with changing tractional needs, able to make changes to the torque split in under 20 milliseconds. That's 20 times quicker than it takes to blink. Up to 20% of the power on offer can be sent to either axle based on the grip available. Now this won't make the Echo Sport into any kind of off-road vehicle, but it'll certainly make the car more sure-footed through the next snowy snap. Should you find yourself on an unmade track, you'll be glad of the fact that the 190mm ride height is significantly higher than with other SUVs in this class. That's also the major reason why this Ford can wade through water up to 550mm deep, a depth that other B-segment SUVs couldn't even think about tackling. The other off-road stats aren't quite as encouraging though. An approach angle of 21.0 degrees, a departure angle of 33.3 degrees, and a ramp breakover angle of 23.3 degrees. But of course, figures like those will be a complete irrelevance for typical Echo Sport owners, who will be more interested to know about this car's aptitude for the urban jungle, a train you'll be able to tackle from a raised driving position over 150 millimeters higher than that of a Fiesta. That's not something you can take for granted in a small SUV these days. In fact, most rivals feel disappointingly super mini-like from behind the wheel, not this one. If you can live with the ride and handling caveats I mentioned earlier, there's plenty to like here as you thread through small traffic gaps you might not as easily have been able to see in a conventional small hatch and the eager EcoBoost engine spins away beneath your right foot. True, the magazines might warn you away from EcoSport ownership, but a significant number of potential buyers could end up very much liking this car. We can understand why they might. Looks a lot better, doesn't it? This improved Echo Sport can't quite get away from a shape that's still touched too tall, narrow, and boxy. But visually, what we've now got is a huge improvement on the original Hoeo Ramos pen design, which had a front end sheerer than the north face of the Iga. What was previously a cutesy and cartoonish shape is now far more mature and purposeful, featuring a front three quarter profile that Ford says was inspired by rucksack straps. 
it's all supposed to reflect what the brand likes to see as this Echo Sports adventurous character. As you've probably noticed, the biggest changes feature here at the front end, where the rather awkward basking shark style nose of the original model has been replaced by this sleeker trapezoidal grille that gives the car more of a family resemblance to Ford's larger Cougar and Edge SUV models. It's flanked by headlamps featuring LED daytime running lights, below which sit angular fog lamp housings that were also part of the redesign. Now, as usual, um, on a car in this class, there's a silver grey lower panel strip to try and suggest the kind of skid plate you'd get on a properly serious SUV. In profile, the changes made to this revised model are harder to spot, unless you happen to notice restyled wheel rims that vary between 16 and 18 inches in size. We've got 18 inches here. Ford's designers have resisted the temptation to add in the black plastic clad wheel arches that you get with many rivals in this segment, but that kind of finishing does decorate the lower sill line. Plus, above entry-level trim, you get the roof rails that now seem to be an almost obligatory feature on a model in this segment. And talking of trends, Ford has got with the one that sees buyers in this sector wanting to order their small SUVs with contrast-coloured roofs. This being an option with this mid-range trim level and a standard feature on the top ST line variant that also features a full body kit. One trend customers in this class weren't interested in following was that for tailgate mounted spare wheels. That was a feature that you had to have on the earliest versions of this car, but one that Ford quickly made optional as buyers discovered how awkward it made operation of the side mounted tailgate. Now, it's still possible for buyers opting for entry-level trim to order an Echo Sport with a spare wheel clunkily stuck on the back, but otherwise the car will present itself as here, with this largely unremarkable rear end enlivened only by these so-called rear three-quarter pillar kickers. Apparently, these small deflectors either side of the tailgate glass improve the aerodynamics, as, more obviously, does this high-mounted roof spoiler. A further lower silver grey skid plate style panel finishes things off. Underneath all of this tinsel lies quite an old platform that originally developed for the sixth generation Fiesta that Ford introduced back in 2008. However, the brand is quick to point out that mounted upon it is an advanced structure that uses high-tech boron steel designed to increase strength while reducing weight. But if the underpinnings haven't changed much, the interior certainly has, being almost unrecognisable from the ugly, angular cabin that was foisted upon us by the previous version of this car. What's been delivered now has borrowed much from the most recent 7th generation Fiesta, primarily the prominent SYNC 3 infotainment touchscreen that dominates the centre of the dash, replacing the tiny little display that was there before above rows of cheap tiny buttons. Because many of the functions these controlled can now sit within screen menus, the fascia is, well, much cleaner, uh, with a redesigned centre stack incorporating these smart climate control dials. The instrument binnacle you view through this smarter, higher quality three-spoke steering wheel is very different too, with its two main dials separated by a 4.2 inch monitor. This provides the expected trip computer functions, but in addition also delivers a digital speedometer, uh, a compass, and information on audio and phone settings. Now, it all contributes to a different level of cabin sophistication that's emphasized by the much higher quality trimming. The doors, for example, get soft touch faux leather panels, as well as shiny piano black inlays that also feature above the glove box and around the base of the center stack. There's adjustable interior lighting too that can be set to one of seven different colors. And the revised seats also look smart, featuring part leather trim with classy contrast stitching, providing you avoid entry level trim. They're a little more supportive than before too, though still a little narrow. That's a welcome, as is the ease with which it's possible to get comfortable thanks to a wide range of wheel and seat adjustment. 
in a sector full of rivals that often don't feel very SUV-like at all once you get inside, it's refreshing to report that this Ford has a properly raised crossover class driving position, which is a boon when you're trying to negotiate tight city streets. Unfortunately, though, these thick A-pillars do rather obscure your view at junctions. Rear three-quarter vision is a little compromised too, the small rear side windows hampering your over-the-shoulder vision. So on an entry-level variant, it's almost essential to pay the extra for the optional rear parking sensors. Earlier, I mentioned the new SYNC 3 infotainment setup. Let's tell you a little more about that. If you can stretch beyond entry-level spec, which gives you a 6.5-inch monitor, you get this 8-inch screen, including navigation. Uh, both setups feature the proper rotary volume and zoom controls that some rival systems have unwisely dispensed with. Smartphone mirroring via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto is part of the sync package. So is voice activation, something it's worth trying to master so that you can take advantage of the system's impressive one-shot command functionality that allows you to work it using simple phrases like, I need a coffee, I need petrol, I need to park. That way, you'll be able to easily locate nearby cafes, petrol stations or car parks and find destinations like train stations, airports and hotels. The optional B&O Play audio system that we've been trying here is also built into the package, a thumping 10-speaker, 9-channel, 675-watt setup that you'll find hard to resist once you've tried it. Kevin Practicality is another Echo Sports strong point. There's a useful recess ahead of the gear lever, plus twin cup holders with a coin tray by the conventional handbrake, with another recess just behind that. The glove box is of a reasonable size, big enough to incorporate an optional CD player if you still want to play some of your old plastic discs. Just above it is a ledge for smaller items. The cubby by the driver's right knee is almost useless, but we appreciate Ford's foresight in not forgetting to include a slide-out tray beneath the front passenger seat and this overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Avoid entry-level trim, and between the seats, you also get this deep storage box incorporating a lift-out tray with a pen clip and topped off by a sliding armrest. Two rather over-prominent USB sockets also feature at the bottom of the centre stack. Inevitably, there are a few issues, things we'd want Ford to look at for the next generation version of this model. The cruise control buttons on the steering wheel are a bit fiddly, and the gear shift paddles fitted behind it on this automatic model are some of the tiniest we've ever seen. Plus, the center dash touchscreen sometimes attracts reflections, and the ventilation vents uh, just behind it freeze your fingers if you linger too long on the controls. Uh, we mentioned build quality earlier on. Well, the glove box lid and the door handles let the side down a little here, but what's important is that the bits that you regularly interact with, the wheel, the gear knob, and the indicator stalks, for example, all feel significantly more upmarket than is the case with many rivals. On to rear seat space. Getting in isn't especially easy, as the door aperture is quite narrow. But once inside, you'll find the back of an Echo Sport a surprisingly pleasant place to be, thanks not only to the high, airy roof line, but also to the fact that the rear seats are set slightly above those in the front for a better view out. The rather narrow body creates a slight issue when it comes to cabin width, but then you're being rather overambitious if you think you'll comfortably be able to seat three adults across the back seat of any SUV in this class. A trio of kids, though, will be fine, aided by this relatively low centre transmission tunnel. As I've just suggested, headroom is better than most rivals provide. In fact, this is one of the few crossovers in this class that a six-foot adult would be comfortable sitting in the back of, though the caveat here is that you might find the headspace to be a little more compromised if you opt for the extra-cost powered sunroof. That's where the kind of reclining backrest that early versions of this model featured would be useful. This is now absent, as is the kind of useful sliding seat versatility that you get on rivals like Renault's Capture. 
What the designers have remembered to include is a 12 volt socket, though instead of being placed logically on the back of this centre console box, it's been buried away in this little side cubby that can only be accessed by the right hand seated occupant. There's a similar compartment on the other side of the car, but just for stowage. Other places to stow small items include seat back pockets and these rather small cup holders in the doors. Finally, let's take a look out back. As we mentioned earlier, this tailgate need no longer be encumbered by a huge spare wheel, but it is still side opening, which to be frank is a bit of a pain, creating all kinds of awkwardness if you're trying to access the boot when backed into a tight parking space. Even if you're not in a restricted parking bay, but merely trying to get stuff out of the boot when parked at the side of the road, there's the issue that the side opening door is hinged on the left side. Now, that means it opens away from the pavement, so when you get your stuff out, you can't easily put it straight onto the safety of the sidewalk. Instead, you have to either walk around the huge door with your gear or dump it onto the ground, hopefully in a way that will be out of the path of the tailgate when you then swing it shut. Now, all of this wouldn't be such an issue if smaller items could be taken in and out of the cargo area via the kind of opening rear door glass section that many modern estates and SUVs offer. That kind of feature hasn't been provided here, probably because it would be fouled by the huge tailgate spare wheel. It's still possible to order on a version of this model specified with entry level trim. Having said all of that, the side hinge tailgate is a feature you soon learn to live with, maybe even to like. Toyota Land Cruiser owners seem to, but let's get beyond that issue. Once you do and the big doors swung open, you'll find a 356 litre total capacity is provided, which to give you some class perspective is about the same as you get in a rival Nissan Duke, but quite a bit less than some other competitors can offer. At least you're well set if you want to carry really heavy stuff. The boot floor uses a special honeycomb construction that makes it gram for gram stronger than steel and able to support more than 300 kilograms. An adjustable height base panel comes as standard, plus there's a small compartment for smaller items featuring down here on the left with a bag hook available to you up here on the right. There's no underfloor stowage space, just a compartment for the tyre inflation kit that most EcoSport customers will probably be stuck with. If you want more space and can flatten the 60-40 split folding rear bench, then up to 1,238 litres is available. There's no fold flat front passenger seat option, but transport of bulkier stuff will be aided by the way that the smart aluminium roof rails can be combined with optional crossbars to enable bikes and roof boxes to go up top quite easily. Expect to pay somewhere in the 17,000 to 23,000 pound bracket for your Echo Sport once you've allowed for a few well-chosen extras. There are three trim levels with this particular model's mid-range titanium spec likely to account for the lion's share of Echo Sport business, around 40%. The remaining sales will see around 25% of buyers going for base ZTEC trim and around 35% choosing the sporty ST Lion spec that's been added to flagship versions of this revised model. The engine lineup is pretty simple, with almost all customers likely to sign up for one of three versions of Ford's well regarded one litre three cylinder EcoBoost petrol unit, these developing either 100, 125, or 140 PS. The middle 125 PS variant can be ordered with the 1300 pound option of automatic transmission, which is what we're trying here. If you've a budget of at least £18,500 to spend on your Echo Sport and cover a higher than average annual mileage, it might be tempting at first glance to consider the 100 PS 1.5 TDCI diesel version. But to be frank, we'd suggest you avoid this rather feeble, noisy carryover engine. If funds permit, the diesel option that is now worth considering is the new 125 PS 1.5 litre TDCI EcoBlue unit. You have to have this engine with Ford's intelligent all-wheel drive system. In fact, it's the only power plant in the lineup that can be ordered with a 4x4 drivetrain. But that 
and the fact that this variant comes only with top spec trim makes it by far the priciest option in the range. Now, we should position the EcoSport from a Ford range perspective and point out that if you like the SUV look but want a slightly more conventional super mini sized model, your local Blue Oval brand dealer will, for similar money, also offer you the Fiesta Active, a crossover themed version of the company's small car bestseller. Those urban-based folk liking the SUV theme but needing something even smaller can also opt for an active version of the company's KA Plus city car for a few thousand less. And of course, uh, if you want something bigger and Ford badged in the SUV line, there's always the brand's successful Cougar range to consider. But you'll need almost £23,000 for the least expensive version of one of those. On to the value proposition that EcoSport pricing represents. As usual, for proper comparisons, you'll need to be comparing apples with apples by looking at B-segment uh, Super Mini-based SUVs, rather than the C-segment family hatchback-based crossovers that Ford targets with its larger Cougar model. In other words, if it makes more sense, cars in the Nissan Duke segment rather than the Nissan Qashqai class. Now, having mentioned the Duke, we'll start our comparisons there and also consider the rival model whose engineering that Nissan shares, Renault's Capture. If you're shopping at the foot of the EcoSport range, you'll find that both the Nissan and the Renault could save around a thousand pounds or so, but neither car can match uh, this Ford's infotainment provision or its slightly more raised driving position. These things will be important attributes for likely buyers. But of course, these people are also being targeted by a whole range of other volume car makers in this segment. The Volkswagen Group offer similarly priced Volkswagen T-Cross and Seat Arona models. Then there's the PSA Group, who'd like you to consider either the Peugeot 2008, Citroen C3 Aircross, or the Vauxhall Crossland X. Volume versions of the Peugeot and the Vauxhall, which both cost about the same as this Ford, can be rather bland, but the spacious Citroen C3 Aircross is tempting and would be more so if it was better built and its looks were less of an acquired taste. Comparable versions of that Citroen could save you up to £2,000 on this EcoSport. Arguably though, the Ford is more media savvy and things like that matter in this segment. Two other rivals that can't match this Ford for media connectivity include Suzuki's Vitara and Mitsubishi's ASX, both of which cost a similar amount in their most mainstream comparable guises. The Korean makers also offer strong contenders in this class, in the form of the Kia Stonic and the Hyundai Kona. In both cases, though, you'll need to dress these two models up quite a bit to give them the overtly SUV-like demeanour that this Ford has in its DNA. As for pricing, the Kia looks a little cheaper than an Echo Sport at first glance, but with a comparably modern engine will cost you about the same as this Ford. As for an equivalent Hyundai Kona, well, that'll actually cost you a fraction more. Talking of shelling out more, you could easily find yourself paying in the region of around £1,500 more than Ford is asking here if you were to go for comparable versions of segment rivals like Vauxhall's Mokka X, Jeep's Renegade, Suzuki's SX4 S-Cross and Mazda's CX-3. Fiat's contender, the 500X, will also cost you more if you reject it in its slow, inefficient base 1.6 litre petrol form and instead choose an engine more comparable with the performance and frugality you'll get with Ford's EcoBoost technology. Of course, there are cheaper small SUVs in this class from the real bargain brands that would save you decent money over an Echo Sport. Sanyong's Tivoli, for example, which could save you up to around £3,500 or more, though that price gap would be much reduced if you equipped a Tivoli to EcoSport levels. And much of the price difference that then remained would be eroded over the duration of your ownership period by higher running costs and lower residuals. Broaden the scope of your search and you could even theoretically get yourself a comparable car of this kind in the really affordable £11,000 to £13,000 bracket if you went for a Suzuki Ignis, really too small for family use, or a Dacia Duster, a much clunkier proposition for urban driving.
But let's get to the bottom line here, which is that whatever you pitch against it, the value proposition of this Ford will probably end up looking pretty strong, especially once you've taken dealer offers into account. If, having considered all of that, you conclude that it is an Echo Sport that you really want, you're going to need to know just how generous Ford has been with the standard specification. Well, let's see. Even entry-level ZTEC variants get niceties you might not expect to find at the foot of the range. Things like 16-inch alloy wheels, front fog lights, and a quick, clear heated windscreen with heated washer jets. There's also air conditioning, a trip computer, LED daytime running lights, powered heated door mirrors, driver's seat lumbar adjustment, uh, all-round electric windows, a Thatcham alarm, and leather trim for the steering wheel, handbrake, and gear knob. We also really like the included Ford MyKey system that gives you two ignition keys and allows you to program them with preset personal preferences. So, for example, you could assign one of the keys to your teenage son or daughter and use of it would automatically restrict things like maximum speed and stereo volume while preventing vital safety systems from being switched off. And media connectivity? Well, that's well taken care of, courtesy of a standard SYNC 3 media connectivity system that, even at this level in the range, gives you an awful lot. On ZTEC variants, it works via a 6.5-inch touchscreen and includes Bluetooth phone linking, a six-speaker DAB tuner, emergency assistance, and smartphone mirroring via either Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. The system can be operated with voice activation too, and you can use it to download all kinds of apps. To take just a few examples, there's the wildly popular Spotify music streaming service and Hotels.com, an app enabling the booking of rooms in 145,000 hotels in 19,000 destinations worldwide. Other apps available for the Sync 3 system include Audio Teka, ideal if, like me, you like to listen to audiobooks, uh, Kaliki, which reads you daily newspapers. Glimpse, that allows you to share your location with family and friends. And the City Seeker and Event Seeker apps that deliver comprehensive city and event guides, cluing you fully in on wherever your journey might take you. As I said at the beginning, though, the majority of likely buyers are going to want this car in the mid-range titanium trim we've been trying here. At this level in the range, the SYNC 3 system I was just talking about operates with a larger 8-inch screen and includes navigation and a rear-view camera. Plus, you get a package of extra features that will make Echo Sport ownership feel that bit more special. Things like partial leather seat trim, 7-shade interior ambient lighting, climate control, cruise control, a centre console with a sliding armrest, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror and rear parking sensors. Outside, titanium models are identifiable by silver roof rails and larger 17-inch 10-spoke flash grey machined alloy wheels. And they benefit from power folding mirrors, auto headlamps and rain sensing wipers. At the top of the range sits ST Line trim, which gives this model a sportier look courtesy of a special ST Line front grille, slightly lowered sports suspension, uh, black roof rails, a large rear spoiler, 17 inch five spoke dark tarnish alloy wheels and an ST Line body kit. The contrasting colour for the roof and the mirrors is also standard, while inside with this trim level you get sports pedals with stainless steel inserts, branded door threshold plates and red stitching for the steering wheel, handbrake and gear knob leather trimming. On to options. Now it's worth pointing out that, as is so often the case, you won't be able to specify much of the really important stuff if you limit yourself to entry-level spec. Stretch up to the middle of the range and titanium trim though, and you can avail yourself of the two features that Ford is making most noise about with this improved model. First up is the B&O Play 10-speaker 675-watt premium audio system, which promises so-called 360-degree sound. And on a titanium spec Echo Sport variant, you'll probably also want to tick the box for the contrast colour roof and door mirror option that I mentioned was standard with that top ST Lion spec level. 
with a titanium trim derivative, though the four roof colour options you get at the top of the range are reduced to just a couple, shadow black or frozen white. And annoyingly, if you opt for either one of them, you'll have to do without the roof rails that would otherwise be standard. What other options ought you to look at? Well, we'd consider the Comfort Pack, which gives you heat for the front seats and steering wheel. And we might also look at adding in a sunroof, a rear privacy glass, a CD player, front parking sensors and keyless entry. Avoid entry-level trim and two styles of larger 18-inch alloy wheels will be available to you. Oh, and bear in mind that if you order this car in any colour other than blazer blue or race red, you'll have to pay extra for it from the range of premium or exclusive body colours. We've got an exclusive silk colour here. What else? Well, titanium buyers will also be offered a titanium luxe pack, which gives you full leather upholstery, HID headlamps and heated front seats. Those limited to base ZTEC trim might want to consider adding in rear parking sensors, but will probably be less likely to pay extra for navigation, given the ease with which a navigational app can be downloaded through the Sync 3 system. By the way, one key advantage of sticking with ZTEC spec is that it's the only trim level in the range that gives you the option of specifying any kind of spare wheel, though unfortunately this has to be mounted clunkily on the outside of the tailgate, which isn't ideal. Talking of practical additions, you might also want to look at a detachable tow bar, a boot liner, wind deflectors and the usual carpet mats and mud flaps. Roof rails can also be added and you might additionally want a bike carrier or a roof stowage box. Enough with extras, let's take a look at standard safety provision. The thing that rather gives away the reality that this isn't an all new generation design is the fact that it can't be had with many of the camera driven safety features that you'll find with more recently introduced rivals. So you'll look in vain on the spec sheet for things like autonomous braking and lane departure warning. Some compensation here though lies in the fact that every Echo Sport comes as standard with the potentially life-saving emergency assistance setup that competitors would make you pay extra for. In the event of an accident, uh, this system will automatically call the rescue services to summon assistance anywhere you might be in Europe. It's also worth mentioning that a blind spot information system is available at extra cost. One of those setups that warns you if on the move you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. As for more conventional safety provision, well, as with previous versions of this car, all the various elements provided are integrated under Ford's intelligent protection system. This gets as many of the electronic safety features as possible talking to one another to ensure a coordinated response should you get out of shape or try to drive your Echo Sport into something solid. You certainly aren't going to feel hard done by in the airbag department, this Ford being fitted with twin front side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag. The seat belts feature load limiters and pretensioners, plus there are anti-submarining seat bases and Isofix child seat mountings on the outer rear seats. The not so good news is that the boxy shape of this Echo Sport resulted in a so-so 58% Euro NCAP test result for pedestrian safety, so don't step out in front of one. Fortunately, plenty of thought has gone into how owners can avoid collisions in the first place. And to that end, there's all the usual expected aids for braking, traction and stability control. Plus, you get tyre pressure monitoring and standard hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. It's a lot harder to get a boxy crossover model to return efficient fuel and CO2 figures than it is with a conventional super mini or family hatchback. Uh, to illustrate the point, let's take the 1 litre EcoBoost petrol powered Eco Sport model I'm driving here. 
The 125 PS engine beneath the bonnet returns 65.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle when fitted to Ford's Fiesta. Here it manages 54.3 miles to the gallon, which is a bit of a drop, but probably acceptable given the extra 136 kilograms of curb weight this car must cart around. It's a similar story when it comes to CO2, the Fiesta's 98 grams per kilometre showing, falling to 119 grams per kilometre here. I mentioned curb weight, Ford makes a lot of the way that this model's boron steel construction reduces weight while increasing structural strength. Now that may be so, but the fact still remains that an Echo Sport weighs more than virtually all its direct segment rivals. It's about 50 kilograms heavier than a Nissan Duke or high-end Kona, about 120 kilograms heavier than a comparable petrol turbo Citroen C3 Aircross, and about 170 kilograms heavier than an equivalent Renault Capture. Now those are big deficits for the frugality of the little EcoBoost petrol engine to make up. Amazingly though, it largely manages to do just that. Inevitably, this Ford can't get anywhere near the returns posted by the featherweight PSA Group Citroen, Peugeot or Vauxhall models in this segment. If though, you look at the other rivals just mentioned, you'll find that the fuel and CO2 returns that you get from 100 PS and 125 PS EcoBoost EcoSport variants are broadly the same as those you'd manage in a uh, comparable high-end Kona or Renault Capture and they're actually significantly better than you'd manage in our 1.2 litre DIGT Nissan Duke. We mentioned earlier in this film that we wouldn't really recommend the base 100 PS 1.5 TDCI diesel variant, but it is undeniably very frugal, managing 68.8 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 107 grams per kilometre of CO2. Impressively, the newer 1.5 litre TDCI Eco Blue variant can exactly match these figures, despite offering an extra 25 PS of power and being weighed down by an all-wheel drive system. Ford has put in a great deal of work into the EcoBlue unit to make these figures possible using clever water-air charge cooling for more efficient combustion, uh, an integrated intake manifold for optimised engine breathing and a high pressure fuel injection system for more precise fuel delivery. Of course, whatever Echo Sport variant you choose, the biggest determining factor influencing your efficiency returns will be you. There's no efficiency score system on the infotainment screen to help you here, uh, the kind of thing that some rivals offer, but you do get the usual gear shift indicator on the dash, and a stop-start system is fitted across the range to cut the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. What else? Well, residuals should be par for the mainstream contenders in this class. In fact, uh, Ford says that according to figures from independent industry experts, this facelifted Echo Sport should be worth between £725 and £1,675 more than an equivalent version of the pre-facelift version after a typical three-year 30,000 mile ownership period. The warranty is the usual three-year 60,000 mile package, extendable to a fourth or a fifth year for not a lot extra. Plus, you get a year's roadside assistance included too. As for insurance groupings, well, to give you an idea, this 1 litre 125 PS EcoBoost model is rated at Group 12E. The 140 PS 1 litre EcoBoost ST Lion variant would attract a Group 14E rating. And the 100 PS 1.5 litre TDCI diesel is rated at Group 11E. When it comes to booking your Echo Sport in for a checkup, you can do this online through the My Ford portal. This is part of the Ford Blue Service Scheme that wraps up all the care and maintenance of your car into one bundle that also includes a free 30-point e-check of vital parts. Now here, any work required will be highlighted with red, amber or green traffic light warnings on a report uh, you'll be given that will rank items needing attention in order of their importance. There's also the Ford Service app that you can download to your phone for free. It lets you locate your nearest dealer to make maintenance bookings. Uh, plus, as a bonus, the app can help you find petrol stations and even has a Park Me feature that remembers where you left the car to save hunting for it in busy multi-stories. 
The fuel and CO2 figures for the 140 PS version of the 1 litre EcoBoost variant are the same as those for the lesser powered versions. In this guise, the EcoSport is a much more promising prospect. It looks a more serious product and is in almost every respect. The EcoBoost petrol engines remain a big draw, plus as before, this car is properly priced and decently equipped. We're also very much impressed by the extent to which the cabin's been so greatly improved. In short, this is more like the kind of product we should have had from the very beginning. That's not enough though to make it any sort of class leader. There remains the problem with this model's awkward side hinged rear tailgate. And even if you don't mind that, there's the issue that other rivals still offer more interior space or ride and handle better. Perhaps it's fortunate then that neither of these two things tend to be attributes overly prioritized by the typical super mini sector SUV buyer. These people often attach greater importance to things like media connectivity and a more overtly SUV-like demeanor, both areas in which this Ford could appeal over its key competitors. At the wheel, you'll sit higher than you probably would in that alternative B-segment SUV model you've maybe been thinking of and interact with a clever SYNC 3 media system that'll connect you better. Typical dealer deals may also leave you more money for that all-important product personalization that you'll probably want. Ultimately, it's been hard for Ford to get round this model's fundamentally South American origins. In this form, though, rivals will at last have to start taking the EcoSport seriously. It is, finally, a very credible contender. <laughs>